Hey, this is Chase Gregory from Sun Records here with Vance Powell and Sputnik Sound in Berry Hill, Tennessee. Beautiful. Downtown Berry Hill, Tennessee. Beautiful. We're here listening to some multi-track tapes out of the Sun vaults. Right now we have Dancing to the Beat by Clarence Murray pulled up. This was tracked in Fame Studios down in Muscle Shoals. Is this a Rick Hall recording? I don't believe so, no. The producer was Bobby Smith, a guy named okay. Bobby Smith. He also recorded Clarence's brother, Mickey, who we'll get to in another video. But, okay. uh, and as well, he recorded Orion, a bunch of Orion tracks. Oh. On the famous Elvis sound-alike. Sound-alike, yeah. But uh, yeah, this was recorded in Fame, where very notable artists like the Allman Brothers, Etta James, Otis Redding. Ray Franklin. Mm -hmm. Lots of great, great yeah. music came out of that studio. Well, knowing Rick Hall, and I, I, I met him a few years ago, basically everything at Fame was hardwired and nothing moved. Mm. So once Rick Hall kind of got the sound, people wanted to come to Fame and, and use the players and use the sound of the studio. So whether he did it or not, it's still going to sound like Fame. Because mm -hmm. there wasn't any choice to move anything. Yeah. Because nothing moved at all. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, if it ain't broke. Yeah, I guess so. So, uh, well, let's listen to the master of this here. Uh, dance to the beat. Awesome. So this track is a really cool, really good recording. Again, it's a four-track recording, which makes sense for fame. Uh, I think track one here is probably drums and bass. Or no? Uh, oh, drums it's drum, and bass, and guitar. And guitar. Oh, and bass, yeah. Yep. All right. And track two. Sounds like the it's Clarence, yep. yep. Track three. Okay, so there is something cool in here. I heard. B3, great. Four, I have things horns. Now, now, I believe in here, I also hear on track three, the words are. That's the second guitar. That's just a road, or just a B3. Yeah. Oh, no, there it is. There's the, there it is, yeah. All right, so what's cool about this, I knew I heard it, is that this Wurlitzer is the uh, Never Loved a Man Wurlitzer. That's the one that Aretha played, and it is really special. I've actually recorded it a couple times. Um, it's an early tube Wurlitzer, and when you sit down and turn it on, if you have a good player and just play it, it sounds exactly like that record. Mm. And so, that's the one. That sounds so warm. You move around, you knock me off my feet, please pick me up, cause I'm still down. I so that's the fame chamber. And you not around. But no tape slap. I didn't hate it though. No, yeah. Tape slap. It's crazy. It just sounds so much better with the multi-track. Even on a rough mix. Yeah. 
And that's all in mono. Uh, it's a little bit of stereo. Track four is the stereo. Spread them out a little bit. And maybe here, a little of my plate reverb. Oh, Ooh. that's too much. Just a little of that plate would be cool. I mean, if I was remixing this. Right. Please pick me up, cause I'm still down. I open my eyes, and you're not around. Ooh, yeah. You're driving me insane. It's very, very plain. You got the power. Cool. Pound, come on, let's go. Where no one's around. Really, really nice track. I mean, yeah, this one of my very, I, I mean, I wonder if this is, uh, you know, some version of the Swampers playing on that. Yeah, I, I need to check the session report if I can find it because it lists all the musicians. Well, it makes sense if they're playing at Fame. Mm -hmm. You know, you would think they would. Use, yeah. Use yeah now, what year was this? Do we know what year was this? This would have been done in 68 or 69. So, the, the single was released in 69. Most likely that would have been the Swampers, the, mm -hmm. the uh, David Hood and Spooner and, and all that. Most likely, because they kind of split sometime around 68, 69, 70, somewhere there, and went over and, and opened Muscle Sound. Mm -hmm. And um, Rick Hall was trying to, from what I understand, trying to sign them to this like real exclusive contract and... They were getting all these calls to play, but we're really not seeing the financial rewards that, let's say, Rick was as a producer. And so they were like, you know, let's not do this. And they actually were one of the first group of people to sort of make a deal with uh, artists to be like, OK, well, we are going to play on your record, but we're going to get a royalty from the record as the mm. Muscle Shoals sound. A lot like producers swampers. would. Like producers would, but, yeah. but and publishing. Ooh. Because because they were just adding so much to the sound of the record. Yeah, because they were so distinctive. Yep, and just such great players, you know. Um, you know, and, and they're such, you know, such great... I, I, there's so many great stories, uh, and a lot of them I don't know. There's a lot of them, but... Uh, there's one where I can't remember who it was came down and when uh, the band he came in to see the band he was like oh well where's where's all the black folks <laughs> and we're like well there aren't any yeah. and this and he's like what yeah you know like he was just shocked you know but just something in the water down there in Muscle Shoals yeah. Florence it's some magic yeah really great yeah I play this uh, center section there's uh, there's a couple of little technical fun parts in here. They're just stupid things that people don't care about. But back in the day on these multi-track machines, they, they, there's a, there's a thing called punching in and punching out. These horns were definitely done after the fact. Mm. These would probably have been Memphis horns would come down or, or maybe some of, may, maybe it was, maybe it was some of the Swamper guys, but, but um, there's uh, some serious punch out sort of pops and cracks here. Click. Yep. And here's another one. This one right there. And then there's a huge one down here. Or one. But all these are from yep. punching out of the recording. And then at some point, actually, it looks to me like maybe the front half was overdubbed. Because here in the back half, or the middle of the song, we actually get the track. Huh. So maybe they punched the front half. Yep. Interesting. And then obviously those tracks they probably were erased. Yeah. To get the to get the uh, the, the the noise out of it. So. That's an interesting. You tried to stay, uh, I tried to... These are the only things that we can look at and see mm -hmm. by looking at this Pro Tools session, but um, 
you know, if you were to just let this track play, you know, it's possible that there would be a noise in the track, this little pop. Now, when this track was cut, that didn't mean anything because you would hear pops on the record. Mm -hmm. It would just be masked in tape noise. But now in the digital world, it's around, it's the you know, it's a little, hard to hear, but yeah, hard to hear, yeah. but it's it's in there. It's there. And strangely, uh, uh, back in the early days of digital in the eighties, uh, that would have you would have gotten a warning from the pressing plant that uh. there was a there was a click or a pop. So. And look what I found. Love that. We're not sure. Yeah. And then if we go to the very end here, this is one of those fun things I love. It's like somebody just said, okay, that's all I'm gonna do. We're just gonna we're just gonna punch out. <laughs> just love that. So fame originally was built where the drums are just kind of out in the middle of the room. And uh, that's kind of the thing that made fame so hmm. awesome. Uh, and then they had a little booth, they made a little booth. And one of the booths held the B3 and one of them held the singer. But um, it's, it's still this way to this day. They basically built the booth out of like paper. It's just, it's not even a, like a, a sonic deterrent. So you can kind of hear that here at the end. So the vocal's in the booth. Yeah, the vocalist is in the booth, but... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You're having a good time. Yeah, it's just, you know, the booth isn't what I would call like really soundproof. Sure. By any means. There's a couple interesting old things here. Good God Almighty. Nice. Yeah. Shoot. Let's see if we hear it in the track. Yeah, yeah you, you hear don't really hear one. the good God Almighty, but yeah. I just thought it was great. Just what a great track. Just a great feel, man. So good. Mm -hmm. And I, like I said, I, I'm not sure, but I bet this is just the Swampers. Yeah. Doing their thing. We'll confirm. Yeah. Yeah, so awesome. that was, this was originally recorded by the songwriter mm -hmm. who went by the name, uh, his band name was Mouse from the Boys with Brass. Um, okay. Maurice, Maurice Samples is the name of the writer, but I like this version way better. No offense, Maurice. Yeah. This oh, is yeah. a great version. It's. A lot of TV and film action, sync licensing. Mm -hmm. It's a good track. Well, it's groovy. It's it's such a groovy vibe, and the playing's so good, and the singing's great. It's just you know, it's great. Go. Sun awesome. Records. Is this on a Sun Record? So this is. It was released on SSS International. Mm -hmm. If you're lucky enough to find an original single, good for you. Good luck. This is remastered in Atmos on a compilation available mm. on Apple and any other Atmos streaming services. All right. Dancing to the beat.